Section 60 of Reviews by Oscar Wilde. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kirsten Ferreri. Reviews by Oscar Wilde. Edited by Robert Ross. Section 60. Early Christian Art in Ireland. Pall Mall Gazette, December 17, 1887. The want of a good series of popular handbooks on Irish art has long been felt, the works of Sir William Wilde, Petrie, and others being somewhat too elaborate for the ordinary student. So we are glad to notice the appearance, under the auspices of the Committee of Council on Education, of Miss Margaret Stokes's useful little volume on the early Christian art of her country. There is, of course, nothing particularly original in Miss Stokes's book, nor can she be said to be a very attractive or pleasing writer, but it is unfair to look for originality in primers, and the charm of the illustrations fully atones for the somewhat heavy and pedantic character of the style. This early Christian art of Ireland is full of interest to the artist, the archaeologist, and the historian. In its rudest forms, such as the little iron handbell, the plain stone chalice, and the rough wooden staff, it brings us back to the simplicity of the primitive Christian church, while to the period of its highest development we owe the great masterpieces of Celtic metalwork. The stone chalice is now replaced by the chalice of silver and gold, the iron bell has its jewel-studded shrine, and the rough staff its gorgeous casing. Rich caskets and splendid bindings preserve the holy books of the saints, and instead of the rudely carved symbol of the early missionaries, we have such beautiful works of art as the processional cross of Kong Abbey. Beautiful this cross certainly is, with its delicate intricacy of ornamentation, its grace of proportion, and its marvel of mere workmanship, nor is there any doubt about its history. From the inscriptions on it, which are corroborated by the annals of Ennisfallen and the book of Clonmacnoise, we learn that it was made for King Turlough O'Connor, by a native artist under the superintendence of Bishop O'Duffy, its primary object being to enshrine a portion of the true cross that was sent to the king in 1123. Brought to Kong some years afterwards, probably by the archbishop, who died there in 1150, it was concealed at the time of the Reformation, but at the beginning of the present century was still in the possession of the last abbot, and at his death it was purchased by Professor Macallo, and presented by him to the museum of a Royal Irish Academy. This wonderful work is alone well worth a visit to Dublin, but not less lovely is the chalice of Arda, a two-handled silver cup, absolutely classical in its perfect purity of form, and decorated with gold and amber and crystal, and with varieties of cloisonné and champlev enamel. There is no mention of this cup or of the so-called terra brooch in ancient Irish history. All that we know of them is that they were found accidentally, the former by a boy who was digging potatoes near the old Rath of Ardagh, the latter by a poor child who picked it up near the seashore. They both, however, probably belong to the tenth century. Of all these works, as well as of the bell shrines, book covers, sculptured crosses, and illuminated designs in manuscripts, excellent pictures are given in Miss Stokes's handbook. The extremely interesting Fiachal Fadric, or Shrine of St. Patrick's Tooth, might have been figured and noted as an interesting example of the survival of ornament, and one of the old miniatures of the scribe or evangelist writing would have given an additional interest to the chapter on Irish manuscripts. On the whole, however, the book is wonderfully well illustrated, and the ordinary art student will be able to get some useful suggestions from it. Indeed, Miss Stokes, echoing the aspirations of many of the great Irish archaeologists, looks forward to the revival of a native Irish school in architecture, sculpture, metalwork, and painting. Such an aspiration is, of course, very laudable, but there is always a danger of these revivals being merely artificial reproductions, and it made me question whether the peculiar forms of Irish ornamentation could be made at all expressive of the modern spirit. A recent writer on house decoration has gravely suggested that the British householder should take his meals in a Celtic dining-room adorned with a dado of Ogham inscriptions, and such wicked proposals may serve as a warning to all who fancy that the reproduction of a form necessarily implies a revival of the spirit that gave the form life and meaning, and who fail to recognize the difference between art and anachronisms. Miss Stokes's proposal for an arc-shaped church, in which the mural painter is to repeat the arcades and, quote, follow the architectural compositions of the grand pages of the Eusebian canons in the Book of Kells, has, of course, nothing grotesque about it. But it is not probable that the artistic genius of the Irish people will, even when the land has rest, find in such interesting imitations its healthiest or best expression. 
Still, there are certain elements of beauty in ancient Irish art that the modern artist would do well to study. The value of the intricate illuminations in the Book of Kells, as far as their adaptability to modern designs and modern material goes, has been very much overrated. But in the ancient Irish torques, brooches, pins, clasps, and the like, the modern goldsmith will find a rich and, comparatively speaking, an untouched field. And now that the Celtic spirit has become the leaven of our politics, there is no reason why it should not contribute something to our decorative art. This result, however, will not be obtained by a patriotic misuse of old designs, and even the most enthusiastic home ruler must not be allowed to decorate his dining room with a dado of Ogham's. End of section sixty. Early Christian art in Ireland.